Some of you, as I said, may be shocked that the overall impact of colonialism can be open to question at all, but it's rare that any complex phenomenon like colonialism, or democracy, or freedom, or nationalism, or capitalism, or socialism, is either simply good or bad. Moreover, the evaluation of such phenomena change with the times, they change historically, seen one way in one era and very differently in another. It is and should be the university's role to help promote this ongoing process of evaluation and re-evaluation. So, that said, let me introduce our participants to what is more than just a lecture, but I hope a model intellectual act. And I will uh, introduce them both now and then invite them consecutively, one after the other, uh, to come up on the stage and to deliver their comments. So the lecturer is Dr. Bruce Gilley. Um, he is a professor in the political science department at Portland State University in Oregon. Um, he has written five books, um, some of which certainly, uh, of their nature, third world politics, touch upon or require uh, an understanding of colonialism and its impact. They are, among other things, I'll give you all five of them. The Nature of Asian Politics, Cambridge University Press, 2014. The Right to Rule, How States Win and Lose Legitimacy, Columbia University Press, 2009. China's Democratic Future, How It Will Happen and Where It Will Lead, it's an optimistic book. Uh, Columbia University, 2004. Model Rebels, The Rise and Fall of China's Richest Village, University of California Press, 2001 and Tiger on the Brink, Jiang Zimin and China's New Elite, also University of California, uh, 1998, and a variety of other books, 27 peer-reviewed articles, some of which are on colonialism. The one that's sort of the occasion for uh, this talk, my inviting him, uh, was an article that has the same title as the lecture, which was two years ago, I believe, one year ago, uh, accepted by a well-known peer-reviewed journal in the field uh, called Third World Studies, um, and then had to be withdrawn because the editor of the <coughs> journal, who was based in London, was receiving death threats that the Metropolitan Police of London told him were serious. And he asked Professor Gilley if, for the sake of safety, the article could be withdrawn, and Professor Gilley consented. So, uh, thank you all for being here, and uh, let us begin um, with Professor Gilley. This is the first time I've given a public talk on this topic, more than a year since a global lynch mob tried to stop me from publishing my peer-reviewed article, The Case for Colonialism. The University of Oxford, whose chancellor was the last colonial governor of Hong Kong, had to keep my talk there in May secret because he could not trust his own faculty to behave like adults. So, students of Texas Tech, you should be proud to be the first to have a public lecture where this can be done. My article of September 2017, The Case for Colonialism, was published in the Third World Quarterly, as Dr. Balch mentioned. The purpose of the article was to outline what I and many colleagues in the harder social sciences believe is the clear evidence for the benefits and legitimacy of the second phase of European imperialism, which ran roughly from the mid-1800s to the mid-1900s. I also spent about half of the paper discussing how those valuable lessons could be recovered by today's weak and failed states. As a professor at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government told me after the outstorm out about the storm about the paper that the paper I wrote has been, quote, brewing for some time, unquote, and someone was bound to write it. But for the 16,000 people around the world who signed petitions demanding the retraction of the article, any evidence or discussion of the evidence needed to be suppressed, not debated. <laughs> 
A week after the article's appearance, as has been mentioned, the editorial team asked for my permission to withdraw it because credible death threats, and I obviously assented. The article has now been republished in the National Association of Scholars House Journal Academic Questions in this past April. One of the fairest criticisms of the paper was that I did not provide enough evidence or documentation for the central claims about the objective benefits and subjective legitimacy of colonialism, although that section of the paper absorbed only 1,500 of the 7,000 words. To that end, I have since provided what is in effect the missing bibliography of the paper, entitled Contributions of Western Colonialism to Human Flourishing, a summary of research, now available in its version 1.0 on my website and on the research site ResearchGate. I could easily spend this entire talk going through the rigorous social scientific research that I gather there, which in my mind shows what should be in any case a statement of the obvious. When a more advanced society is given the opportunity to diffuse its economic, technological, administrative, and educational systems to a less advanced society that by and large welcomes its presence, the results are so obviously good compared to what would otherwise have happened in that society that the only interesting questions are how large the positive effects are. I would highlight from that bibliography recent work by Fair and Sacerdote, as well as Easterly and Levine on economic development, by Shurkins on labor mobility and wage growth, by Donaldson on railroads, by Samadar on the rule of law, by Brahms as well as Figer and Asifu Adeji on public finances, by Shaw as well as Sartori on human rights, by Hariri on modern state building, by Olson as well as Woodbury on democracy, by Basu on education, by Massani on cultural preservation and articulation, by Grindel on the abolition of slavery, by Selhausen on female emancipation, by Calvi and Mantovelli on public health, by Boomgard on food supply and population growth, and by Etimad on the vanishingly small numbers of Europeans who ran colonial administrations, which speaks to the question of legitimacy. From this research, we know that in terms of body count, nothing comes close to anti-colonialism in terms of having cost lives and prevented lives. You simply have to do the math and compare trajectories in the late colonial period of the 1920s onward, when populations were growing, food supply expanding, life expectancy leaping upwards, government administration improving, wages and living standards bowling forward, and plans for self-government unfolding, and compare the widening gap of those trends with where most, but not all, former colonies ended by, say, the late 1980s. But I fear that such a talk would not change many minds, because as I have come to realize, this is not really a scientific debate. Most anti-colonial critics will roll their eyes when you try to engage them in questions of social scientific research, because the real motivation is not getting history right, but getting the present right. Either they reject research findings as yet more evidence of Western imperial imperialism and the need to quote unquote decolonize research, or they fear that formerly colonized peoples have such fragile psyches that they could not withstand an encounter with facts that make them uncomfortable. You may have heard of the case of Helen Zeal, the former premier of the Western Cape province of South Africa, who in June this year was found guilty by the country's ethics board of improper conduct for tweeting after a visit to Singapore that South Africa should similarly build upon the valuable inheritance of British colonialism rather than trash it. South Africa provides a powerful image of this problem. Its 25 year slow motion collapse since the end of apartheid is closely linked to its inability to embrace its British colonial past. In 1993, the average Singaporean was 4.5 times wealthier than the average South African. Today, they are seven times wealthier. In 1993, it took one Singapore dollar and 1.8 South African rand to buy a US dollar. Today, it takes 84 Singapore cents to buy a US dollar, but 6.2 South African rand using purchasing power equivalents. Such declines in living standards might not make great photos or great Wikipedia articles, but they cost far more lives. The ethics board that censured Zill cited the mob attack on my article as evidence that the voicing of pro-colonial viewpoints should be curtailed. In her defense, Zill quoted no less an authority than Nelson Mandela, citing the benefits of British colonialism in South Africa. Clearly, these are lessons that the lawless and ignorant public prosecutor who found Zill guilty does not want to learn, nor do most anti-colonial critics. There's a second reason why I do not think it would be productive to go through the social scientific research on colonialism. 
We today live in a post-truth era in which social media and Google are more authoritative sources of information than robust research. It took Donald Davidson, an economist at MIT, 10 years to research and publish his new article in the American Economic Review, Railways of the Raj, that shows unambiguously the positive impact of railroad development in colonial India. It takes a critic only one second to Google and find the Congress politician Shashi Tharoor declaring in the Guardian newspaper that the railroads were quote unquote a colonial scam that harmed Indians. So I'm going to use this talk to engage in a more rhetorical and topical presentation that I think at the very least will lay out the arguments for colonialism. In 1887, a woman belonging to the Muslim Hausa ethnic group was born in the slave-based Sokoto Caliphate of what is today northern Nigeria. The Caliphate was the creation of the Fulani ethnic group, which had defeated and subjugated rival tribes in a series of wars between 1804 and 1808, including the Habe branch of the Hausa to which this woman belonged. Fulani rule decayed with each successive ruler, so that by 1886, when the British government gave a monopoly for trading in the region to the Royal Niger Company, the subject peoples of this empire were ready for a change. The Royal Niger Company found ready partners willing to sign treaties in exchange for liberation from Fulani autocracy. In 1899, the British government assumed control of the region from the Royal Niger Company, and in 1900, its troops, mostly black natives, arrived in this woman's village named Karo to assert their control. Quote, we Habe wanted them to come. It was the Fulani who did not like it, unquote. The woman, known as Baba, recalled. Why, you might ask, would an African woman welcome European colonization? Baba explained, quote, when the Europeans came, the Habe saw that if you worked for them, they paid you for it. They didn't say, like the Fulani, commoner, give me this, commoner, bring me that. Yes, the Habe wanted them. They saw no harm in them, unquote. Was this just an initial response that Baba of Cairo later regretted? No, far from it. As she explained, life got immeasurably better after British colonization. The best thing the Europeans did was free slaves and depose indigenous tyrants. Quote, the Europeans don't like oppression, but they found a lot of tyranny and oppression here, people being beaten and killed and sold into slavery, unquote. For her personally, another benefit was the improved status of women. Quote, in the old days, if the chief liked the look of your daughter, he would take her and put her in his house. You could do nothing about it. Now they don't do that, unquote. Baba of Cairo told her story over a six-week period in December 1949 and January 1950 to the English anthropologist Marie Felice Smith. The testimony was published as Baba of Cairo, a woman of the Muslim Hausa, in 1954. Your library holds the book. And you can listen to an online interview that the BBC did earlier this year with Marie Felice Smith, now in her 90s. What are we to make of this first-hand account of an African woman's experience of the coming of colonialism? It is strange that Baba welcomes the coming of the British, wrote a scholar from Niger in a 1994 essay. Yet a moment's reflection, he wrote, shows why it made sense. Baba of Cairo faced a concrete choice as a young girl between the relatively benign rule of the British and the fearsome rule of Fulani tyrants and the slave and wife raiders they protected. So, the scholar from Niger wrote, it was not the British, but the slave raiders and the Fulani who were the, quote, nasty other. In fact, the British never became the nasty other for Baba of Cairo. She was perfectly content in her cultural space, and the British protected and enlarged that cultural space by removing the threats to it from slave raiders and Fulani tyrants. The peace and security of British rule were the main changes that colonialism brought. Life went on more or less as usual in other respects, which is why no one thought of resisting the British, and why, why most of Baba of Cairo's book is about social relationships during her time. There was no tension in Baba's worldview between being pro-colonial and pro-Habe. Quite the opposite. The British facilitated the articulation of an authentic, living, and surviving Habe culture. Why do I dwell at such length on the story of Baba of Cairo? Because it is such a profound rebuke to the contemporary anti-colonial writers who presume to make the choices that women like Baba faced over a century ago. Among the widely circulated critiques of my paper, one was written by an American journalist who found some gruesome photos from King Leopold's Congo on the internet and then ramped up his outrage with claims that my paper amounted to Holocaust denial. 
If you will indulge me, let us imagine a conversation between Baba of Cairo and a composite of the various writers who have attacked my paper, whom I will call Edward of Boston. Edward, Baba, how could you endorse a system that dismantled your governing institutions and replaced them with unaccountable alien rule? Baba, actually, Edward, our governing institutions even before the Fulani Empire were more autocratic than anything the British imposed. In any case, like most colonized peoples, we lived under alien rule already when the Europeans arrived. Either a rival ethnic group or a rival subgroup or faction were always in charge. Circa 1900, rule by the British, the most accountable political system in the world at the time, versus the caliphs of Sokoto, hell yeah. Edward, but once you accepted British rule, self-government became impossible, whereas you could have slowly democratized the Sokoto Caliphate. Baba, eyes as big as saucers. The British began talking about preparing their colonies for self-government in the 1850s. The Caliphate believed only in the rule of Islam. Colonialism was the pathway to self-government. Isn't that what happened in Boston too, Edward? What about the atrocities committed by colonial rulers throughout the 19th and 20th centuries? Amritsar, Namibia, Mau Mau, and in your country of Nigeria, there were those 57 women traders shot dead by colonial police in 1929 over taxes. There are a lot of pictures and Wikipedia articles on the internet. I see how enlivened you are talking about atrocities, Edward. Why do you know so little about the atrocities in world history that did not involve Europeans? One reason is that they were not recorded. You'll find no pictures of them on the internet, Edward, and no Wikipedia articles. We know about the frontier wars in British settlement colonies because they were recorded, investigated, debated, and yes, the atrocities were punished by the British. You like the picture of severed hands in the Congo under King Leopold II, Edward. Have you seen the pictures of the piles of bodies in the Eastern Congo under Al-Zubir, or the torched villages left in the Congo by Tipo Tip? They were the most fearsome of the many Sudanese, Nubanese, and Egyptian slave traders and ivory tyrants who terrorized the Congo area before the relatively benign rule of King Leopold II. Would it surprise you to learn, Edward, that most people welcomed King Leopold's rule. Indeed, that is what explains how Tipo Tip, who began as governor of the king's eastern holdings, lost control. Why are there only four books on Tipo Tip, but at last count hundreds on King Leopold II's Congo Free State? Do you care about actual history of peoples like my own, Edward? And by the way, King Leopold's Congo Free State was not a Belgian colony. It was a private fiefdom whose abuses were precisely the argument in favor of Belgian colonization in 1908. How could you get such a basic fact wrong, Edward? Yes, perhaps you should be forgiven. Because the American journalist Adam Hochschild subtitled his 1998 book, King Leopold's Ghost, quote, a story of greed, terror, and heroism in colonial Africa, unquote. I guess American journalists are just sloppy with facts. Although Hochschild notes in his book that the free state, quote, was shared in no way with the Belgian government, unquote. But Baba, you keep changing the subject. My subject is colonial atrocities. My subject is saving human lives. Even when native atrocities were recorded somehow, like the Nama massacre of a fifth of the Herero population in today's Namibia in a single day in 1850 at a place now known as Murder Hill, where women's feet were chopped off to obtain the copper rings they wore around their legs, you don't seem interested, Edward. Didn't you read what I told Marie Felice Smith about the constant warfare and murder my people faced under the Fulani? We did not have cameras like the Belgian lawyers investigating the atrocities of King Leopold's private fiefdom. In any case, I guess you would roll your eyes in boredom. And by the way, the suppression of the Mao in Kenya and the women's war in Nigeria were both justified. The use of force was proportional to the threat. That's why most Kenyans and most Nigerians supported the colonial governments. Indeed, they did most of the restoration of order and the prison work. Amritsar and Namibia, on the other hand, were crimes to be sure and they were immediately recognized as such by the colonial governments and those responsible punished. In any case, sorry to come back to counterfactuals, Edward, but the Herero and Nama in Namibia, for example, were longtime rivals who were stockpiling arms for a war each other at the time of German settlement. Do you think they would have resolved their differences with a roundtable conference? Yes, I am lucky, 
I was not a victim of a colonial atrocity or a colonial settlement war. I was, however, the victim of a Fulani atrocity after slave raiders carried off members of my family. Please read my book, Edward. Even the libraries in Boston have copies. Even so, Baba, you seem to be engaging in a sort of morally cold-hearted cost-benefit analysis that the good things that came with colonialism can offset the bad things. I'm still not sure what the bad things are in my case, Edward, but to give you the benefit of the doubt, let's throw some possible things out there. The humiliation and psychological harms of alien rule, the short-circuiting of our indigenous development path, the empowerment of chiefs with the backing of colonial coercion. Yes, perhaps these were harms in some cases, and when harms cross some threshold, they can never be justified by goods. But none of these, even if true, which I doubt, came close to that in my case. Are you saying, Edward, that the survival and longer lives that my Habe people enjoyed after the British should be weighed against unaccountable chiefs or psychological harms that seem to be mainly a concern of French-educated intellectuals? Maybe you just have false consciousness, Baba. You believe the British were legitimate rulers, rulers who had more of a right to rule your people than the feasible alternatives, because you really had no choice. You had a gun to your head and you rationalized your behavior. Didn't your professors ever teach you how demeaning it is to dismiss viewpoints with which you disagree, especially among the common people, as false consciousness? Maybe the silly little people like me could not think for ourselves, as you imply, Edward. A whole generation of Western academics has dismissed voices like mine as false consciousness. But it was the elites who chose to invite and ally with the British in northern Nigeria. They had a choice to fight, but chose cooperation. The man who would become the premier of northern Nigeria at independence, also from a small tribe like mine, wrote this of the coming of the British, quote, there was no ill will after the occupation. We were used to conquerors, and these were different. They were polite and obviously out to help us rather than themselves, unquote. Okay, but really, colonialism goes way farther back, to the 16th through the 18th centuries, when the British were major slavers, and their American, Canadian, Australian, and New Zealand settlers were massacring all and sundry. Shouldn't we throw that into the equation too? Should we? And call them morally reprehensible for doing what every non-Western culture, including my own, was also doing at the same time, simply without the technological and economic capacity of the West to make it work? These were frontier battles. Every empire, Ottoman, Qing, Russian, Japanese, was expanding its frontiers through warfare at that time. That's what empires did. The Zulus in Southern Africa, the Mari in the South Pacific, the Bantu and Buganda in East Africa. I mean, do you know how they came to occupy their ancestral homelands, Edward? And not only in ancient times, the Mari of New Zealand massacred most of the 1600 Moriori people on the Chatham Islands in a single day in 1835, and then claimed the islands as their ancestral homeland. And where did the ideas for changes to those expansionist norms come from? Actually, from Europe. The Dutch lawyers who developed ideas of international law, the Quakers who led the push against slavery, the Scottish and English liberals who developed ideas of land rights. So you are appealing to norm shifts that came from the European colonizers themselves. It matters. It's not the same thing as burning down a fellow's house and then offering to rebuild it. A better analogy is the slumlord who has a moral awakening and decides she is going to live better. She chooses to set higher standards for her rental units, fixing broken pipes, keeping the heaters on. She advocates among her fellow slumlords to make this a norm. Eventually, they make it a law. Are you telling me, Edward, that she has no business claiming to have done good because she used to be a slumlord? Okay, but in the end, they stole your money. They took your commodities. They locked you into economic dependency. They paid us, as I told Marie Felice Smith. My family's children had job opportunities we could never dream of. And by the way, you Marxists have a strange way of understanding economics. Commodities cannot simply be pulled from the earth and deposited in a bank. If they could, resource-rich countries like mine would be rich instead of poor. Why? Because wealth comes from an economic system. It comes from free markets, the rule of law, global trade, corporate organization, social trust, investment certainty, worker training and education and infrastructure. Do you think this stuff just happens, Edward? Do you have any idea why Boston is so prosperous? Because of the large number of clams in Boston Harbor? Well, Baba, you're really flogging a dead horse here. I mean, nothing, nothing 
will ever convince most people that colonialism was a good thing. Perhaps Edward, but truth matters to me and it should matter to you too. And it also matters because it has lessons for today. Have you heard of Chinua Akebe, the great Nigerian novelist? In his last book, he reminded his readers that Nigeria benefited a lot from British colonialism and urged them to reclaim some of that past, like excellent administration and meritocracy in government and business. I'm sorry, Baba, I can't debate this any longer. I'm late for a mental decolonization rally at the Graduate Student Union. Your mind has been colonized by a half a century of gibberish about the evils of Western colonialism, Edward. A little decolonization of that material would be good for you. Frowns, smiles. Over the past year, I've had many, many debates of that sort. The critics have now retreated to calls for censorship with the claim that while they believe in free speech and academic freedom, they draw the line when it comes to research on colonialism that they believe is factually inaccurate or which is violent and oppressive. The new terms they have invented are academic integrity and academic monitoring so that scholars with inappropriate ideological orientations, such as me, are put under the charge of scholars with advanced ideological views who seem mostly to be found in English departments. As a scholar of China, my teaching of Mao's cultural revolution will never be the same. One obvious response to such charges is, to borrow John Stuart Mill's defense of liberty, that you will never really know whose arguments are factually correct and normatively defensible unless they are exposed to the strong gale of counter-argument. I am glad that Dr. Bjork accepted Dr. Balch's invitation to rebut my arguments for that reason. The more substantive response would be this. If factual or social scientific validity and normative defensibility are the standards by which we should judge scholarship on colonialism, then I submit that the problems of inaccuracy, misrepresentation, and ethical sophistry giving rise to scholarship that perpetuates violence and oppression against formerly colonized people lie in the main with the anti-colonial scholars who dominate the contemporary academy. Over this time, I have received letters and testimonies from dozens of people in the former colonial areas, writing in support of me and thanking me for giving voice to voices which have been silenced for half a century. One was written by a Nigerian woman, now my Facebook friend, who is an educational consultant in that country. She called the mob attacks on my article in an essay she wrote for a African online publication, Comitas US, quote, a bilious personification of anti-intellectualism, unquote. Many Nigerians, she wrote, quote, see the colonial era as something of a golden age, unquote. The most lasting legacy in her view was education, which is the focus of her research. Quote, will I ever be able to publish my research? This is the fearful state that outraged mobs have put myself and others in. But I won't be intimidated. I will say what I believe to be true, no matter what, unquote. She's a brave Nigerian woman and is trying to help her country by recovering lessons from British colonial institutions that young people may use in their educations. Recently, just a week ago, I received an email from a young Indian scholar studying for a graduate degree in Shakespeare here in Texas. He wrote, my great grandfather born to field laborers in Southern India was educated by Christian missionaries, Britishers, the very colonizers I am supposed to hate. He was having been so educated, commissioned by the British government to found and run a high school in the village of his birth. His son, my grandfather, was the first of that village to complete high school as well as to complete university. Moreover, he was employed by the British government as a statistician, which was very prestigious in those days. My grandmother, similarly educated, was able to go as far as a master's degree because of the educational system set up by the British. It is because of, the, it is because of colonialism that my family was educated, elevated far beyond the station of their birth, and it is because of this colonialism that I am able to study Shakespeare at an American university rather than labor in a field in India. Both of these authentic voices from people in former colonized areas, and many more have written, uh, and you can find their essays on my website, are being told by progressives, mostly in the West, that they need to shut up. I stand with them.
Still, to Edward's point about flogging a dead horse, why should we really care? Many of my colleagues will say privately that they agree with me, but why enter into this fraught debate and risk being called a white supremacist or a Holocaust denier? It's not worth it. And frankly, I'm starting to agree with them. To some extent, I think pragmatism is the best way forward. It's complex. It brings out bitter memories. The question is, where do we go from here? I think there are both intellectual and institutional prescriptions, but I put the most store by the former. And indeed, most of my paper has to do with how to recover the lessons and institutions of colonialism as one of the fixes for today's weak and failing states. In an essay for the Indian magazine Open that I published in October, I wrote about the profound dis psychological disconnect that continues to afflict many third world countries in their relations with the West. I was writing about the Nobel laureate V.S. Naipaul, who died in September, one of the great intellectuals to emerge from the third world. A native of Trinidad, whose ancestors had migrated to the British colony from India, Naipaul was profoundly aware of the great what might have beens of his life. He called the West the leader of a, quote, universal civilization, unquote, that was alone, freely accessible to all and sundry, including himself. Colonialism had given countries and peoples like him access to this universal civilization. It was regenerative and beneficial because it allowed the world's diverse civilizations and cultures to flourish. Those who tore it down were like children pounding on the chests of their parents. And I give an extended treatment of the case of Guinea-Bissau in the original essay where that tearing down and that destruction was epic. I began this whole research project with another article in the scholarly journal African Affairs, writing about Chinua Kebe, the Nigerian novelist, who is largely misrepresented as being anti-colonial. He's not. He urged an intellectual reformation on his countrymates that has yet to take place. China's economic boom is a result of an intellectual coming to terms with colonialism. It's largely prompted by the example of Hong Kong that was on its border. That British colony, according to Paul Romer, the former chief economist of the World Bank, did more to reduce poverty in the third world than a half a century of Western aid because it created a model for China that China could emulate and use. Success requires coming to terms intellectually with the positive legacies of colonialism as China did and as Helen Zeal has urged upon her countrymen in South Africa. But this intellectual turn requires a massive enlightenment, and I don't see signs of it yet. No less an otherwise reliable newspaper than the Wall Street Journal recently carried an article, an approving article, on the decolonization of Belgium's Royal Museum for Central Africa. According to the article, the, quote, woefully dated statuary, unquote, and the, quote, exoticism, unquote, of the museum is being airbrushed in a makeover in which colonial era imagery will be countered with the new images showing, quote, unquote, colonial era oppression and asserting in the title of one statue a burgeoning Congo of today, including a robot used to control traffic in Kinshasa. Colonial apologists, quote unquote, will be sent packing by the new museum and instead Belgian visitors will be abjectly told of the cruelty of their ancestors and by ascription themselves. And how, but for their meddling in Central Africa, there would have been a land of milk and honey. The fact is that the Congo under Al Zubir and Tipo Tip was doing anything but Belgian. And after the Belgians colonized the country in 1908, it entered into its only era of burgeoning, which lasted until so-called independence in 1960, under pressure from those who the great chief of Luanda, of the Congo center, called, quote unquote, loudmouthed minorities. This, by the way, according to the Contemporary Academy, makes the great chief of Luanda a white supremacist a charge that I presume the old chief would have considered evidence of the inscrutable ways of the West. And those robot-controlled intersections in Kinshasa? It's a story that the Western liberal media loves, and it repeats old tropes about an African renaissance. But it is more evidence of Africa imploding. They are designed to prevent bribery caused by mistrust between police and people. The robots cost $27,000 each and are paid for by foreign aid. They sidestep the issue of administrative capacity and state society trust. A writer for The Atlantic calls them, quote, a public relations stunt that turns attention away from serious growth and infrastructure issues, unquote. They appeared after municipal elections were canceled, quote, 
the flashy modern way to distract the public from scrutinizing bad governance, unquote. So, the decolonization of the Royal Museum for Central Africa perfectly embodies the fatuous nature of anti-colonialism. A Belgian colonial state that made lives better for ordinary Congolese is being scrubbed from history and replaced by a robocop that symbolizes the tyranny and dysfunction of contemporary Congo. The institutional fixes are more straightforward. Let's show a picture. Look at this picture. I chose it because it's relatively benign. It's a picture on the right of a boy found by a Danish aid worker in Nigeria in 2016 who had been left to starve to death by the local community because they believed he was a witch. UNICEF estimates that in this one southwestern state of Nigeria where he was found, there are 15,000 children similarly abandoned by their parents as witches and nationwide 10,000 a year added to the rolls. I pair the photo with one from the Biafra War on the left that erupted in Nigeria after independence and cost between one and three million lives. The Danish aid worker who found this boy got together with her local Nigerian colleagues and established the Land of Hope Children's Center in Nigeria for rescued children, most of whom are considered to be witches. The Nigerian government is unable and unwilling to act against this cultural practice. ExxonMobil has funded the center, along with a lot of international donors. The center is essentially playing the colonial role of filling in a governance deficit. Here's a happier picture. Here's some of the boys of the Land of Hope Center on the left, uh, a picture of the staff on the bottom, and the young boy who was rescued from the street on the right, now thriving with hearing aids because he had lost his hearing as a result of malnutrition, but nonetheless thriving. This borrowing and replication of the governance functions embedded in a country's colonial past is one way that I suggested in my paper for recolonizing failing parts of the third world. The other was for Western governments to formally share some sovereign functions like public finance and law and order, a model that has been successfully attempted in various African countries in recent years. There's a third way I suggested in the paper that the colonial inheritance could be brought back to good effect. What do you think would happen if the British were invited back to rule a small parcel of land in Nigeria, somewhere where no one lived, just as Lagos, Singapore, Accra, Hong Kong, and Aden were sparsely populated places until British colonialism turned them into humane, decent, and opportunity-filled places? This is the idea of the charter city, suggested by Paul Romer back in 2009, in which a host nation would consent to hand over sovereignty for some fixed period, say 99 years, in order to stimulate development and diffusion of good governance. Over that period, people from the host nation who wanted to migrate to the charter city could do so at the discretion of its authorities. Charter cities would be risky. Sir Paul Collier, the great development economist, told our gathering at Oxford in May that the problem with charter cities is that if they do not work, local politicians will be blamed, and if they do work, local politicians will be blamed. This all stems from a fundamental problem. Anti-colonialism has become so entrenched, not just in the Western Academy, but in the politics of many failed states, that nothing short of an enlightenment that ushers in a productive encounter with the modern world will do. Charter cities are the developmental equivalent of a moonshot. Still, sometimes you reach the moon. Let me close my remarks with a reminder that this issue is coming soon to a public policy issue near you. A few weeks ago, I received from Rhode Island's principal archaeologist, Timothy Ives, an advanced copy of his forthcoming paper in the journal Northeast Anthropology. It discusses the growing problem of anti-colonial agitation among contemporary Native American activists. This is closely linked to the decolonizing movement elsewhere. The specific question at stake in his paper is whether mysterious piles of stones often found throughout New England were left behind by early European farmers to prevent soil erosion, demarcate boundaries, or simply store the debris from cleared fields, or by earlier native groups 
as ceremonial stone landscapes with spiritual meaning. Being a trained and professional archaeologist, Dr. Ives published a paper arguing that most of the piles are from European settlers. Guess what happened next? Of course you know. He was quickly labeled a racist with an unreformed colonial mentality whose research represented violence and oppression against native groups and who should lose his job, if not worse. Native American radicals intent on quote unquote decolonizing research with so-called insurgent methodologies, as in this case, are doing their people no favors. For such approaches are an abandonment of the shared justification based on logic and evidence that makes knowledge possible. They reduce Native American knowledge claims to nothing more than rent seeking and political activism. That is, they make them easy to ignore, thus marginalizing those groups. The piles of stones, I'm sure they will sort themselves out. I'm more worried about the children of Native American communities and the children of anti-colonial third world countries being brought up in a toxic social atmosphere in which they are taught from a young age that science is nonsense, that they are eternal victims of colonial society, that they bear spiritual wisdom no matter what choices they make in their lives, and that they serve their people by rebelling against the modern world. That's what I call violence and oppression. And that, in a nutshell, is the case for colonialism. Thank you.